In this lesson, we're continuing our discussion of common law murder. Specifically, we're going to focus on the felony murder rule. So at this point, we've already fleshed out what common law murder is. Remember, it's three elements. The unlawful killing of another human being with malice aforethought. And in our last lesson, we broke down in a lot of detail what malice aforethought is. And if you remember, it really comes down to committing a killing with a specific mental state. That's how we get to malice aforethought and ultimately how we get to common law murder. And if you remember, we talked about the first kind of three ways we can get to that mental state requirement of malice aforethought being the intent to kill, the intent to inflict grievous bodily injury, and reckless indifference to an unjustifiably high risk to human life, which we called depraved heart murder. The last mental state we need to talk about, and it's another way we can imply malice aforethought on the defendant to get to common law murder, right, is going to be the intent to commit a felony under the felony murder rule. Here, our starting point rule when we're thinking about the felony murder rule is as follows. A person is liable for murder if a death of a human being results from conduct during the commission or attempted commission of any felony. Right, so what makes the felony murder rule kind of interesting is that we can have a defendant liable for murder, in some states, first degree murder, right? A very serious offense, even if that person had no intention to kill somebody or inflict any type of bodily harm, right? The only intent requirement is that they intended to commit a felony. Right, so usually where this presents itself, if we're thinking about issue spotting criminal law fact patterns, when should we start thinking about the felony murder rule? It's usually going to look like some kind of crime gone wrong, right? A crime gone bad or a crime gone wrong. Maybe the most classic example is a robbery, right? Let's say that we have a person who wants to steal property and the way that he wants to steal somebody else's property is by committing a robbery, right? A common law robbery is the taking and carrying away of the personal property of another by force or threat of force with the intent to permanently deprive that person of their property. The key distinction of a robbery though is you're going to use force or a threat of force to steal somebody else's property. Right, so let's say that this person wants to commit a robbery, so he goes out and gets a gun, right? He's gonna use this gun on a victim to you know, put them under duress and steal their property. So let's say he goes, he gets a gun, and he finds somebody on the street, and he goes up to him and he says, hey, you know, give me your watch. He goes up with the gun, points the gun at the victim, and says, hey, give me your wallet, or else I'm going to shoot you with this gun. Right, so of course our victim's under duress, you know, starts to get their wallet out. But let's say that the victim, while they're getting their wallet out, they're under all this pressure and duress looking at a gun being pointed out of them, that they get so frightened, so flustered, that they actually have a heart attack and die during the commission of this robbery. Right, and the question ultimately for us on a criminal law fact pattern is going to be, well, is the defendant liable for murder, right? We have a homicide, right? The killing of another human being, right? We have a person who has died, right? Well, obviously step number one, like we said in our first video on criminal homicide is we'd want to verify that our defendant is the actual and proximate cause of the victim's death. Here, we'd probably be able to show that, right? We'd be able to show that the defendant's conduct, right? All the actions that constituted this robbery ultimately were the actual and proximate cause of the victim's death. So we'd probably be able to show that our defendant did kill the victim. The next question would be, okay, we have a homicide. We have a killing of a human being, right? Our starting point rule, if you remember in step two is, well, is this murder? Right? And at common law, we know, okay, well, murder is the unlawful killing of another human being with malice aforethought. So how do we determine whether, if we know we have a killing of another human being, we have to ask, okay, is there malice aforethought here? So we go through our mental states that get to malice aforethought, intent to kill, intent to inflict grievous bodily injury, depraved heart murder, and intent to commit a felony. 
Immediately, we could look at the facts and say, well, our defendant didn't have an intent to kill, right? Let's say that our fact pattern tells us that this robber, right, this defendant who's going to commit the robbery, honestly, subjectively, does not want to harm anyone, right? He, maybe he's desperate for money, but he absolutely does not want to kill anyone. He does not want to harm anyone. His goal is just to scare this person a little bit, take the property, and run off, right? It's not an intent to kill, not an intent to inflict grievous bodily injury. So we know this person does not have malice of forethought, right? Our defendant does not have malice of forethought based on an intent to kill, an intent to inflict grievous bodily injury, right? Maybe something there with depraved heart murder, but the first thing we'd be thinking about is intent to commit a felony because it's very obvious from our facts that this defendant did have the intent to commit a robbery. Right, so we'd immediately jump to the felony murder rule, which is a way we can imply malice of forethought. And we'd see, right, a person is liable for murder if a death of a human being results from conduct during the commission or attempted commission of any felony. Well, let's say robbery is a felony, right? So we have this person who has died, right? Our victim died as a result from the conduct of the defendant during the commission of a robbery. So our starting point rule, and we'll have to think about some limitations on the felony murder rule here, but before we analyze the limitations, right, our starting point rule would be, well, then yes, this defendant is liable for murder under the felony murder rule. Even though they may not have had an intent to kill, an intent to inflict grievous bodily injury, maybe they were somewhat well-intentioned, doesn't matter, right? Under the felony murder rule, that's still murder. Not manslaughter, not something mitigated down, it is murder under the felony murder rule. And in some states, we'd see that could even be first degree murder, right? The most serious level of murder, right? And we'll see, Right, most modern statutes grade felony murder by degree, specifically listing what felonies constitute first degree murder. Right, so in most states, the way this works is, right, in states that have felony murder rules on the books, the way this is going to work is the state is going to say these specifically listed felonies, right, if Right? If this rule is satisfied, right? if we have a death of a human being that results from conduct during the commission or attempted commission of these specifically enumerated felonies, it's actually first degree murder. Right? And we know first degree murder is generally punishable by death or life in prison. Right? First degree murder is a very serious offense. And we're going to talk more about the distinctions between first and second degree murder in later videos. But for now, we can accept first degree murder is a really serious offense. So in the example we just went through, in a lot of states, right, they're going to have robbery listed as a specifically enumerated first degree murder felony. So in that situation where we had a defendant who didn't want to hurt anybody, right? He did not have an intent to kill, an intent to inflict grievous bodily injury. Maybe he didn't have an intent to hurt anybody at all, right? In some way, he was what you might call somewhat well-intentioned in the sense that he really didn't want to harm another human being. But because he did have the intent to commit a felony, and if that felony was specifically enumerated by a state to be a felony that constitutes first degree murder under their felony murder rule, then that suspect, that defendant, could be liable for first degree murder, could ultimately be punished by death or life in prison, right? Technically, now whether or not that would actually happen, right? We don't have to worry about how sentencing works, but you know, technically he would be liable for death or life in prison, even though it was kind of just a robbery gone wrong, right? He didn't have that intent to kill, that intent to inflict grievous bodily injury, right? If the state has said that robbery, right, is specifically enumerated, robbery is going to be first degree murder. If we have deaths that occur, right, as a result from conduct during the commission or attempted commission of a robbery, that constitutes first degree murder, you know, which a lot of states would have robbery specifically enumerated as first degree murder, right? That would be the outcome, right? So what most modern statutes do though, is they're gonna say, here's the specific felonies that are first degree murder. If there's a commission, if somebody dies, 
right, as a result of the defendant's conduct during the commission of some other felony that's not specifically enumerated in this statute, right, then it's second degree murder. So they'll have all their felonies that they think are really bad and should be first degree murder. If it's not one of those, generally then it would be second degree murder. Right, and different states are going to have different things specifically enumerated, but generally, right, there is an acronym, BARK, right, B-A-R-R-K, burglary, arson, rape, robbery, and kidnapping. Those would all usually be kind of what we're thinking about as the most inherently dangerous felonies, first degree type murder felonies, right? If you're conducting any of those, right? If we have a defendant who's engaged in a burglary, an arson, a robbery, a rape, a kidnapping, any of those go wrong and somebody dies, right? Those are the types of felonies that a lot of states are going to say is actually first degree murder, right? So, this is the starting point rule. There's going to be, right, it is a, you know, by the way, somewhat controversial rule. Uh, the United States is one of the only countries out there. You know, we got this rule from England and it's been abandoned by England in most foreign countries. So a lot of people are going to say, you know, this is a really harsh rule. Felony murder just as a concept for the exact reason we just kind of illustrated, right, where you can have a person who had no real intent to cause harm and they're getting you know charged with first degree murder potentially death penalty or life in prison sentences right so some people can say they you know that's really harsh right on the other side you're gonna have people saying well don't commit felonies right and you're not going to be charged with felony murder so it is one of those it is a note worth making it is controversial but it still thrives here in the united states Right now, we do have some limits on the felony murder rule. Number one, right, most courts have narrowed the scope of any felony, right? Most courts in most states, right, have actually limited this. They're saying, look, you're not going to be liable for murder if a death of a human being results from conduct during the commission or attempted commission of any felony, right? A limitation is put on this, and really, it's inherently dangerous felonies. Right, we say many states, most states, but not all states, limit the felony murder rule to homicides that occurred during a felony that is dangerous to human life. Right, and even this, there's really two approaches. We have a, a, a more, uh, an approach that looks at the nature of the statute, the language of the statute itself, and we have an approach that kind of looks at the facts of the case when we're determining, well, what is a felony that's dangerous to human life? Because that's always going to be the question here. If we're limiting the felony murder rule to felonies that are dangerous to human life, right, inherently dangerous to human life, what do we mean? What type of felony is inherently dangerous to human life? Well, there's two major approaches here. Some states are going to look at, some courts are going to look at the actual language of the statute and say, is this crime, when we look at the language of this statute, is it inherently dangerous by its nature? And some courts are just going to look at the facts of the case, you know, care less about the actual language of the statute. You know, what was the defendant's conduct here? And the application of this felony as looking at the defendant's conduct was the defendant being dangerous here, right? And that will be the test under the more kind of fact-specific approach. So for example, think about robbery, right? We just went over robbery, right? Robbery is pretty much in any state going to be considered an inherently dangerous crime, right? Because if we look at the language of the statute, right, most of the time, I mean, if we look at the common law definition of robbery, there's a requirement that the stealing actually occur by force or threat of force, right? The common law definition of robbery is going to be something like a taking and carrying away of the personal property of another by force or threat of force with the intent to permanently deprive that person of their property. The idea being though, 
you know, it's virtually impossible to, you know, commit a robbery without putting human life in danger because the definition of the statute says you have to use force or threat of force to be liable for robbery. Therefore, it's inherently dangerous, right? You can't safely commit a robbery, right? You inevitably have to put someone's life in danger. Just looking at the language of the statute, it's an inherently dangerous felony, right? Compare that, though, to something like larceny. Right, larceny, by the definition of its statute, is not inherently dangerous. Right? A larceny is just the taking and carrying away of the personal property of another by trespass with the intent to permanently deprive. Right? There's no requirement that force or threat of force be used. Right? You can commit a larceny with no human beings around. Right? So you can commit a larceny without in any way putting human life in danger. Right? Say that a you know, person is out in public, right? And they see somebody leaves, you know, a $20 bill on a table at a restaurant, right? They get up to go to the bathroom for a couple of minutes and they like drop a $20 bill on the table. So this person, our defendant goes up, takes the $20 bill, takes it, carries it away with the intent to steal that $20 bill. Right, so they've taken the $20 bill without consent with the intent to permanently deprive. Right, that would be a very classic kind of larceny, right? And no human life is ever put in danger there in that if we look at the actual facts, the way that that larceny was committed, no one was actually put in danger, right? And the actual just language of the statute, if we look at what the larceny statute says, right? A taking and carrying away of the personal property of another by trespass with the intent to permanently deprive, right? That's not inherently dangerous, right? Now, of course, you could commit a larceny in a way that does endanger human life, right? Let's say that instead of a $20 bill, our suspect is stealing, I don't know, medication from the victim. They say this victim has a medical condition and they have to take this medicine, right? Or they die, right? And let's say that our victim leaves this medication on the table, right? Goes to the bathroom for a minute, leaves the medication on the table. And let's say that our defendant goes up to the table, looks at the bottle of pills and is like, oh, wow, this person needs this right, to survive. Oh, well, I don't care. I'm just going to steal it anyways and take this and carry it away, right? Well, that would be a larceny, right? The taking and carrying away of the personal property of another, right, by trespass with the intent to permanently deprive. But now it's very dangerous to human life, right? You're stealing something from this person that they need to actually survive. You're not taking a $20 bill off the table. You're taking life-saving medicine, right? So, in courts that follow the you know more broad approach right looking at just the language of the statute they're going to say well look inherently a larceny is not dangerous right so if this person actually ended up dying if our victim came back and their medication is gone and as a result of this they die right the courts that define inherently dangerous felonies right, based on the actual language of the statute, not the defendant's conduct, they would say, those courts would say, well, a larceny is not inherently dangerous. So this is outside the scope of the felony murder rule, right? So this defendant would not be liable for felony murder because a larceny is not inherently dangerous. But courts that look at a more fact by fact scenario, right? They'd say, well, in this instance, right, the definition of the statute might not be inherently dangerous. But when we look at the facts of this case, what the defendant did obviously was endangering human lives. Therefore, we'll say as it's applied in this case, it is inherently dangerous. So it is within the scope of the felony murder rule. In those courts, the defendant could be liable for felony murder. Right. And as always, the theme you should always remember, if we're in a court that says this is outside the scope of the felony murder rule, that doesn't mean it's not murder, right? It just means it's not felony murder, right? It could be some other type of felony, right? If the defendant had the intent to hurt this person, looked at the pills and was like, oh, you know, if I take these away, I know it could kill this person, right? Maybe it's intent to kill you know, reckless indifference to an unjustifiably high risk to human life, right? Depraved heart murder. Lots could be on the table still, right? 
So as always, and I know you keep hearing me say this again and again, just because it's not the defendant's not liable for one crime doesn't mean the defendant's not liable for any crime. But we're just talking about the felony murder rule, right? That's how courts are going to limit it on those two approaches, right? We're thinking about what an inherently dangerous felony actually is. Our next limit on the felony murder rule is the merger limitation. This should be somewhat intuitive. Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program, or LEAP for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap. Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata video. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Studicata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else um, in any of the other online resources that I've found. So I would certainly recommend Sudakata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're going to do great. I would definitely uh, recommend Studicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it, uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Studicata video lectures throughout my law school career. And I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.